Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, what a nice audience here today. Thank you guys for all being here. Give yourselves a big round of applause for showing up today. The perseverance of our support here in the community, I just, I'm always grateful for all of that. Um, and guys, give uh, Mr. Tom Durkin his first round of applause today. As you can see, we're decked out in our NASA white shirts and black ties here uh, for today's program. Um, just a few things I want to say here um, so that you guys know what's coming up. I mean, I had the opportunity to spend some time with folks that I haven't had opportunity to talk to for a while, but make sure you go hang out in the museum a little bit. There's been an awful lot of changes and enhancements that have happened with a new replica T-Rex uh, dinosaur exhibit that's in the museum, our mural uh, painted by Evans Flamand Sr. And then we have a brand new teepee by Martin Redbear. And I want you guys to put on your calendars next Friday, starting as early as 11, we're going to do a teepee rising, okay? So one of our education committee members, and by the way, you don't have to be on the board of directors to be on the education committee as an example, has organized to have a group of young Native American youth come help raise the teepee. There'll be a blessing for the teepee, so you guys will be able to come and really experience Lakota culture right inside the museum. Um, the program at two is called Paha Safa Zulia, which is, in Lakota, Black Hills Journey. Okay, so the whole day is all about celebrating Lakota culture and art. And um, here's the best part. We're not even gonna charge admission, okay? We just want you to come in and help celebrate all of this stuff with us. Um, but one of the things that I'll remind you guys all of is, is that obviously museums, you know, have conversations. How has it gone for you guys? Where's your membership? Your membership helps us do these types of right things where we can invite the community in and, and be engaged in, in learning about all of our community members. So I know a lot of you are members. So I thank you for your memberships, but we're, we as an organization try to balance some opportunities where we're not worried about charging admission, but doing the right things. Next Friday will be that for sure pass that word around. There'll be lots of stuff coming out on social media here as we evolve that. Then already the following Friday, another day where we just want you to come in and join us. We're going to celebrate the journey turning 25 years of age. Now actually, it's a little premature because we actually turned 25 on May 18th, but we moved it up a little bit mainly because of the fact that this year is 50 years from the 1972 flood. So we wanted to kind of spread these things out a little bit Plus, we want to celebrate our birthday for longer than just a day or two, okay? But that, that Friday in two weeks, uh, Megan Ostringa, who's our archivist curator, works on our education team, she'll be up here talking about the history of the journey so far. And as far as museums are concerned, you're a baby until you turn 25. So we're ready to not be a baby museum anymore. We're trying to grow up. We're going to have some fun, cool stuff like some of the original commercials that were out there in 1997. Uh, when the journey was starting up, you'll get to see some of the early architectural drawings. Um, and it's, it's kind, of a, kind of fun uh, to have seen what was some of that vision and where we're at today. And I know we're working hard on what will the next 25 years look like. Uh, those are some of the conversations uh, that we're having here within the community in case you saw last night's news story about us talking about more archive and preservation space. So it's all things trying to keep us looking forward. So next two weeks, we just want you to show up, bring friends, okay? Come and support the Journey Museum's efforts, uh, and we know you will, so thank you. Thank you in advance, all right? So it's Friday, next Friday, Pahasafa Zulia, following Friday, the Journey's birthday party. All right, so let's talk about Tom. All right, I, he's special. He's very special. He, uh, he's been with myself here at The Journey since I came on board. Uh, I think uh, Tom might have called me in my first month of employment and said, Troy, uh, The Journey is an, a, 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 an affiliate member with South Dakota Space Consortium, and we need someone to be on the board. <laughs> it started that way, and I said, great. Guess what, Tom? We'd like to have you join our education committee. And he said, great. So... We've been kind of doing this since 2014 is the way I look at this. And so um, Tom has helped inspire uh, others uh, to be engaged here at the museum. Uh, we've had interns through the South Dakota Space Consortium. Uh, one program that we'll have this summer, Arjun Iyengar, has done 
I would say four or five programs for us and he still wants to do programs so he's doing one on the James Webb telescope. Um, we have we hope to have space camps again and do all kinds of things, all things uh, space, with STEM and with NASA. I know we'll be up at Neutrino Days and down at the Badlands Astronomy Festival as some of our commitments in education. So I uh, thank Tom personally for his commitment and engagement in the community, helping us educate and inspire. And our goal, guys, is to have one of you on Mars. Okay, that's the deal, right? Somebody from Rapid City gonna make it to Mars. That's what Tom and I hope. Tom went to school uh, in New York, right, at Adelphi University. And I mean, how long have you been in, at the School of Mines now, Tom? Oh, uh, <laughs> just 22 years of employment at the School of Mines. We won't talk, we won't go any further back than that, right? All right, well guys, uh, you're here to listen to Tom and, and uh, uh, it's scary. Apollo 16, 50 years ago. All right. Well, I think Tom's going to recap the whole Apollo thing. And let's get him up on the stage and give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. All right. Very good. So I think I just heard myself on the mic, so you can probably hear me. That's great. So thank you, Troy, for the nice introduction. And happy birthday early. It's interesting. Troy, Troy, the journey will be celebrating 25 years for, uh, uh, for the museum. And the anniversary we're going to celebrate today is, is uh, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16. So each time there's an Apollo mission uh, that passes that 50th anniversary, um, not every time, but, but several of those uh, more famous missions, we've had presentations here at the Journey, but it's been a little while now um, since we did the last one, which was Apollo 13. Um, but. Uh, uh, so really what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out, and, I'm, and a lot of you maybe not, didn't see any of those earlier talks, so I'm just going to very quickly inf include a few slides from some of the other talks to, to, to give you the history of everything that led up to Apollo 16, which will celebrate its 50th uh, anniversary tomorrow. Um, and... Uh, uh, so that, that, that'll, kind of, that'll kind of be the format. And then I'm going to end the talk <coughs> with, with uh, about what we're now doing currently and what we're going to be doing in terms of going back to the moon with an eye toward eventually sending the first human beings to another planet, to Mars. So with that, I'll go ahead and start. So Apollo 16, you can see the mission patch on the left, um, was the 10th crewed mission, the 10th uh, Apollo mission that had uh, people on board, okay? And it was the fifth one to land people on the moon, okay? So, uh, just start with a picture of the moon here. The regular daily and monthly rhythms of Earth's only natural satellite, the moon, have guided timekeepers for thousands of years. Its influence on Earth cycles, notably the tides, has also been charted by many cultures in many ages. More than 70 spacecraft have been sent to the moon, 12 astronauts have walked on its surface, and brought back over 840 pounds of lunar rock and soil to Earth. And actually, the largest single rock was collected during Apollo 16. We'll talk about that in a little minute. Um, and then I, I include this, this picture of the, uh, uh, the room, moon, uh, it appears to be rotating a little bit here, but basically um, we always see the same side of the moon from the Earth. Um, but the moon does rotate on its axis, as does Earth. It takes Earth 24 hours to spin around once on its axis. But the moon's rotation is nearly the same time as it takes the moon to orbit the Earth. So even though the moon is spinning, it spins at a rate in which, as it's turning and going around the Earth from the vantage point of Earth, we only see the near side of the moon. And this is what this picture is showing. Uh, this is a, a month's worth of pictures of the moon from the Earth. And you can see that we only basically see the, that one side. It's called synchronous rotation. Um, tonight, the moon will appear as the picture on the right. This is a waxing gibbous phase. Uh, tonight will be one night before the full moon. 
tomorrow will be the full moon. And that's why Easter actually is the next day, because Easter is always determined as being the first Sunday after the first full moon of spring. And this year, it happens to be one day after the full moon, which is tomorrow night. So two days from now will be Easter Sunday. Okay. And also then, tomorrow being the full moon, just also happens to be the 50th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 16. And this just shows where uh, Apollo 16 landed on the surface of the moon in relation to Apollo 11. There were lots of other landings, but I just wanted to show you Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility, a lowland, whereas Apollo 16 landed in the Descartes Highlands, an area of highlands over here in, in this area. Much, a much rougher area. Now going back to the history a little bit back, you may, you may remember, those of you that are old enough, that in 1961, President Kennedy charged the United States Congress with a very um, uh, a strenuous goal, and that was to send human beings to the surface of the moon and return them safely to the earth by the end of the decade, by the end of the 1960s. So there was only like eight and a half years from the time that he gave us that charge to do it. And we hadn't even sent uh, a person into space yet, just up and down through the atmosphere, not even all the way to the moon. So there was a tremendous amount of things that had to happen in that short period of time to get us to be able to meet President Kennedy's goal of sending a man to the moon and returning him safely to the earth by the end of 1969. So we started with the Mercury mission, which was, were missions where there was only one astronaut on board the Mercury capsule. And you can see a Mercury capsule behind here. There were seven astronauts out of over 530, I believe, that applied to the new NASA astronaut program. Seven were chosen. And those are some of the famous names that you'll remember. Looking from left uh, to right here, we have uh, Gordon Cooper on the left, and then uh, Walter Shearer, and then Alan Shepard, who was the first American in space. And then over here is Gus Grissom. He was a Mercury astronaut, but he was also the astronaut on the famous Apollo 1 flight years later that had an explosion and all three astronauts were killed. But Gus Grissom was also a Mercury astronaut. And then astronaut John Glenn, who went on to become a senator, he was the first American to actually orbit the Earth. He orbited three times. And then uh, next to Glenn, we have Donald or Deke Slayton, and then Scott Carpenter. And each one of them went up in a Mercury spacecraft. Here they are in their Mercury space suits that look a lot different than the much bulkier Apollo space suits that you'll see pictures of in a minute. But these were the, uh, the silver... Uh, uh, Mercury astronaut suits. And then this is just a picture showing the very first mission of Alan Shepard. Uh, you can see it was not an orbital mission. It did not go all the way around the Earth. It was launched from Cape Canaveral and in Florida. It went up to space and then, um, let's see, the altitude was 125 miles and I believe the, we, we consider the international boundary of space at about 62 miles. And then he came back down and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean about 15 minutes later. But he was the first American to make it to space. And it was just a, a matter of a few weeks after we were beat um, on that part of the race with the Soviet Union when they sent up Yuri Gagarin to space and came back down. So the Russians, you remember Pe President Kennedy um, charged our country with this very aggressive goal of going to the moon and back because we were in the space race with the Soviets who were also developing a space program. So we were in a race to show who could be technologically superior and reach these goals first. Well, the ultimate goal was getting a man to the moon, but we lost the first part of that race, the first leg of that race with sending of the first human being into space. The Soviets won that part of the race with Yuri Gagarin. And then I just include one slide here of uh, uh, John Glenn, who then later went up in, uh, in his Mercury capsule. By the way, all of the astronauts got to select the name of their capsule. Um, if you look back at, uh, let's see, 
uh, Freedom. Freedom is the name of the capsule that Alan Shepard chose for his Mercury capsule. And then uh, John Glenn chose the name Friendship. And each one of them had the number seven associated with them in honor of the seven Mercury astronauts. And then after the Mercury program, there were several more Mercury missions. I'm not going to go through all of them. But then we, we advanced to the Gemini missions. Gemini for twins, that had two astronauts in the capsule. And each time we're developing the technology to finally eventually get to a capsule that would hold three astronauts, which is what we use for the Apollo missions. Okay? And uh, the Apollo missions needed three astronauts because two would descend to the surface in a lunar module and one would stay in a command module in orbit around the moon. Okay, so it required three astronauts. And in this case, this is just one of the ten manned Gemini missions. And in this picture on the left here, you can actually see uh, somebody that you'll know the name of. That's Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong started as a Gemini astronaut, and he was eventually the one that was, was, went on to the Apollo program, became an Apollo astronaut, and was chosen as the first human being to set foot on the surface of the moon with Apollo 11. And this just shows a picture of him a few years earlier, about three years earlier, in March of 1966, uh, after completing uh, his Gemini mission. And now we see a very early picture on the launch pad of a very early uh, Apollo-type rocket. The rockets now have to get bigger because they have to hold more weight, a larger capsule, more astronauts. Of course, they have to eventually become much more powerful when, they, when we send them beyond Earth orbit all the way to the moon. And in this, this is a very early picture, 1962, of one of those early rockets on the launch pad at... Uh, Cape Canaveral, which eventually was renamed Kennedy Space Center in Florida in honor of President Kennedy after he was assassinated. Here we just see what's called Missile Row down in uh, Cape Canaveral along the, along the beachfront there. Uh, uh, Launch Complex 14 with, is the big one in the foreground and then the uh, other smaller missile uh, launch sites. And you can just see a number of them uh, along the beach here. Uh, the idea being that, you know, we have to send the rockets up. We're developing the technology so fast to stay ahead of the Soviets and to eventually be able to achieve President Kennedy's goal that, you know, we, if, if one rocket blows up on the launch pad, it kind of damages the launch pad. So you can't wait until you fix all of that. You have to, you have to make many launch pads and to, to test these things in, in, in a quick amount of time. So this picture just kind of shows that, uh, that part. And, and over here in the distance, you can see uh, a lot, let's see. It's actually uh, this building over here is the large vehicle assembly building, which was this massive building that NASA bought to build eventually the rockets so large that become known as the Saturn V rockets that took us to the moon. For many years, it was the largest building in the world, not the tallest, but the largest in terms of inside space. There was no building anywhere in the world larger than the vehicle assembly building because the rockets are so big. This is just a picture, and the picture, of course, doesn't really do justice to this, but this is a Saturn V rocket on the crawler coming out of the vehicle assembly building. But you can see how big it is compared to the little cars out in the parking lot. And this is just, uh, fast forward in time a little bit, but this is a picture of the actual Saturn V rocket that Apollo 11 used. So the Apollo 11 astronauts were in the capsule at the top of this massive rocket on top of this huge crawler. Again, the, the picture doesn't really do justice to the scale, but just imagine, you know, this is a person here, not even as tall as the crawlers on, on this uh, mobile, uh, uh, mobile launcher that very slowly, about one mile an hour, brings the rocket from inside the vehicle assembly building out to the launch pad. It, it, like I say, it travels about one, one mile an hour, and it takes many hours to go the several miles out to the launch pad. And then this slide just shows you that there were 17 Apollo missions. So Apollo 16 was, as they say, the penultimate mission. Penultimate meaning second to last. Okay? So there'll be one more 50th anniversary after this one, and it'll be the anniversary of Apollo 17, and that will happen in December. 
December 7th of uh, this year. So uh, all of these missions were unmanned missions, with the exception of one that chronologically, these are all in chronological order, except for this one. This one was a manned mission. Apollo 1 was initially uh, set to go in, uh, uh, in 1967, but um, in, in, in January of 67. But that's where the tragedy happened, and there was an explosion of the spacecraft on the launch pad, and the three Apollo 1 astronauts lost their lives. So that mission was actually renamed Apollo 1, even though it wasn't the first one. There were three unmanned Apollo rockets that were launched before that, but it was given the name Apollo 1 in honor of those astronauts. It was renamed, renumbered, I should say. Okay. And then uh, starting with Apollo 7, all the way through the end, all of those were manned missions. And this is the picture of the first unmanned uh, rocket that would have been known as Apollo 1, but uh, later had its name changed. And then this is a picture in January of uh, 1967 uh, taken of the three Apollo 1 astronauts that were tragically killed. This was about 10 days before they were scheduled to launch. Um, uh, or actually, it was, it was, it was 10 days uh, actually before the explosion occurred, which was actually not, not the launch day. But uh, a little history on this. In a spacecraft review meeting held with the Apollo Spacecraft Program Office Manager Joseph Shea on August 19, 1966, the crew, these three crew members, um, expressed concern about the amount of flammable material mainly nylon netting and Velcro, in the cabin, which the technicians found convenient, the Velcro, for holding tools and equipment in place in zero gravity. So Joseph Shea gave his staff orders to tell North American Aviation, which was the contractor that built the command service module and the lunar module, instructions to remove those flammable materials from the cabin, but he did not supervise the issue personally. Now, it was known that, of course, being an astronaut is dangerous. So one of the press people interviewed Gus Grissom 10 days before this tragedy and asked him, what do you think about it? I mean, are you scared? I mean, it's dangerous. You know, things can go wrong. Rockets explode. And uh, when you guys are on top, you know, what, 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 of that rocket, what do you think? And Gus Grissom answered it this way. He says, you sort of have to put that out of your mind. There's always the possibility that you can have a catastrophic failure. Of course, this can happen on any flight. It can happen on the last one as well as the first one. So you just plan as best as you can to take care of all these eventualities and you get a well-trained crew and you go fly. And that's, as NASA says, the right stuff. And that's what Gus Grissom uh, had as well as uh, Roger Chaffee and uh, uh, astronaut uh, John White. Uh, here's a picture in January 27th, the day that the actual uh, fire took place. Uh, they were in the capsule for a test. Uh, at that time, NASA had the astronauts breathing an atmosphere of 100% pure oxygen in the capsule. And the problem with that is, you know, if I, the oxygen in this room right now is about 20%. So if I strike a match, the match will burn, but it doesn't blow up. But in 100% pure oxygen, that causes an explosion. And the problem was there was a spark, there was an electrical short in one of the electrical wires, and it sparked, and it caught some of the flammable material on fire, and the capsule exploded. And the astronauts lost their lives very quickly. They didn't suffer much anyway. Um, so that was a real tragedy. And this is just a, a, a picture of the flag-draped coffin of of uh, Gus Grissom as it's being escorted uh, by his fellow astronauts to Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, like technically, I guess, Virginia. But uh, uh, that put a halt on the manned missions for about 11 months um, so that th they could redesign and rethink about how they're going to improve the safety conditions in the capsule for the astronauts. 
So then there were several more unmanned missions. This is Apollo 4, which was in November of 1967, so about 11 months later. There, it took that long before we launched another rocket. And uh, uh, that's Apollo 4. It was a nighttime launch. You can see the launch of that. And we get to Apollo 5, another unmanned mission, um, January of 1968, the launch of Apollo 5. And then Apollo 6 was the last unmanned mission. You can see the Saturn V rocket coming out of the Vehicle Assembly Building. This is the firing room at Kennedy Space Center. So there's NASA Mission Control, which is in Houston, Texas. And then there is Kennedy Space Center, where the rockets launch from in Florida, where they have the firing room. And just look at all of these rows and rows of computers and all the people that are, are, are uh, in charge of, of a certain aspect of the launch of these massive Saturn V rockets. And this is the launch on April 4th, 1968, of the last unmanned mission. Then we get to the first manned mission that actually got off the ground. And that was Apollo 7, with astronauts Walter Cunningham from left to right there, Don Isley and Walter Shearer. They took off on October 11th, 1968. You can see the launch here. Look at the old uh, uh, Volkswagen Bugs. <laughs> Looks like a Corvair or something there, maybe. Uh, at 11.02 a.m. Uh, from Launch Complex 34, Cape Canaveral. That mission was uh, almost 11 days, about 10 days and 20 hours. Uh, the astronauts uh, did not go to the moon, they just orbited the Earth. They orbited about 163 times, uh, trips around the Earth. And then uh, ten, 10 days later, they came down after traveling a distance of over four and a half million miles uh, in orbit around the Earth. They splashed down October 22, 1968, and were recovered by an aircraft carrier. This is just a picture of the rocket uh, about... Uh, literally about two minutes after launch. And then we get to the famous Apollo 8 flight, which was not a moon landing, but we sent three astronauts around the moon. So this is the first time we actually sent uh, a rocket and people around the moon. Uh, it was uh, December 21st through the 27th of 1968, and the astronauts from left to right here are Jim Lovell, who also was the commander of Apollo 13, for those of you that know that story and saw the movie. Uh, he was an Apollo 8 astronaut, and this was a tremendously successful mission, as opposed to Apollo 13. Um, Bill Anders and Frank Borman. And this is just a picture uh, during a, a, a television broadcast that uh, they, they made back to Earth, uh, the Mission Operations Control Room um, at Johnson Space Center. It's the third day of the Apollo 8 lunar orbit mission. Seen on the television monitor in the, uh, the background here is a picture of the Earth. Um, and this was uh, taken by the uh, astronauts looking back when they were about 176,000 miles away from Earth, about three quarters of the way to the moon. And then the next day, they actually reached the moon and at the point in which they went around the far side of the moon, the moon is now blocking the radio transmissions to Earth, so they lost contact with the Earth, as we knew would happen. That was expected. But at that moment, when they went around the far side of the moon, they became the first three human beings ever to see the far side of the moon. And that happened at about 68 hours, 58 minutes, and 45 seconds into the mission. And they snapped some pictures of the far side of the moon. Saw some amazing craters on the far side. Uh, this just looks like a, a desert, uh, never set foot on by a human being, and eventually inspired the words that Buzz Aldrin expressed when he was the second man to step foot on the moon, just minutes after Neil Armstrong did, during Apollo 11, uh, six months later, seven months later, and he described the lunar landscape as magnificent desolation. And then they took this picture as they were coming around the moon. They did not expect that to, to see this, but it was, it, it was the earth rising above 
the moon's surface. And this is a very famous picture, and I usually include this picture in all of my Apollo talks, and I'll give you a little history of this photograph. It's called the Earthrise Image. It was taken during the Apollo 8 mission on Christmas Eve, 1968. The Earthrise photograph was not on the mission schedule and was taken in a moment of pure serendipity, pure chance. It is an image so powerful and eloquent that even today it ranks as one of the most important uh, photographs ever taken by anyone. U.S. nature photographer Galen Rowell described this image as, quote, the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. As Apollo 8 traveled outward, the crew focused a portable television camera on Earth, and for the first time, humanity saw its home from afar, a tiny, lovely, and fragile blue marble hanging in the blackness of space. When it arrived at the moon on Christmas Eve, this image of Earth was even more strongly reinforced when the crew sent images of the planet back while reading the first part of the Bible that astronaut Frank Borman had brought with him. And then they each sent their individual Christmas greetings back to humanity. Frank Borman's final words of the television broadcast were perhaps the most moving. And I can remember this. I was 10 years old at this time, watching along with about a billion people on Earth, either watching this TV broadcast on television or listening to it on the radio. And Borman wrapped up the the Christmas greetings, and he said, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we pause with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. The next day, they fired the boosters for a return flight and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on the 27th of December. It was an enormously significant accomplishment coming at a time when American society was in crisis over Vietnam, race relations, urban problems, and a host of other difficulties. And if only for a few moments, the nation united as one to focus on this epical event. And really, it was the whole world that were united because there were people in every country around the world, if they had televisions or radio, that were watching this. And it just dawned on everybody that when they saw this image, we all lived together on this beautiful little blue marble. And it was really a unifying moment. And I think today, you know, when you, when you turn on the news, it doesn't really matter. At almost any day, you turn on the news and you hear about strife going on in different parts of the world. Um, and I, I, I like to include this picture because I think if, if we think of it from this perspective a little more often, maybe people would learn to get along with one another better than we do sometimes. So with that as a, just a philosophical thought, you can see the U.S. Postal Service actually commemorated this photograph with a, a, a stamp that a, in that days, in those days, cost six cents. <laughs> and then we move up to Apollo 11 with the mission patch here, the eagle representing the, the American eagle, uh, bringing an olive branch, uh, the symbol of peace, uh, to the surface of the moon. And I'll just quickly go through a few slides and before I get to Apollo 16, uh, just because Apollo 11 is such a, such a momentous uh, one of the 17 Apollo missions. The first one when we, we landed a person on the moon. So um, for those of you, I know some of you young guys already know, of course, of Neil Armstrong. He was the first human being to set foot on the moon. He was the commander of the Apollo 11 mission. And then Buzz Aldrin, who I got a chance to meet, uh, uh, a few years ago, was the lunar module pilot. And then Mike Collins, he was the one that stayed in the command module that orbited the moon while Neil and Buzz descended to the surface in the lunar module. And here you can see one of the flight control teams that was actually uh, working on the, the, at the time that the lunar module, the Eagle, named the Eagle, landed on the surface of the moon. You can see there's a dress code there. And in honor of the, uh, uh, the flight controllers, I have on my thin black tie, my white shirt, and my pocket protector. <laughs> and this is Gene Kranz, who was one of the famous uh, flight uh, directors for many of the Apollo missions. You can see the liftoff of Apollo 11, July 1969. 
Here's both Buzz and Neil inside the lunar module. Each took a picture of, of, of the other. Um, and this is the moment, second, milliseconds before uh, Neil Armstrong's foot hit the surface of the moon, taken by a television camera on one of the lunar module's landing legs, catching that special moment when, of course, he said, um, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then this is a picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin that Neil Armstrong took. You can actually see Neil Armstrong's reflection in the visor of Buzz Aldrin standing in front of the uh, lunar module, the Eagle, uh, with one of their surface experiments to measure the solar wind. And here you can see Buzz Aldrin saluting the U.S. flag that they planted. His footsteps are still on the surface of the moon today because the moon has no atmosphere, it has no wind, and therefore the boot prints don't get blown away. And the astronauts of Apollo 11 left this plaque on the surface of the moon. It's signed by all three astronauts, and the president at that time was Richard Nixon who signed it. And it says here, Men from the planet Earth set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. Oh, and then, we came in peace for all mankind. And the recovery after the splashdown, uh, the, the Navy helicopter coming out, uh, picking up the astronauts that are floating in their capsule that splashed down, uh, and then they were picked up by the U.S. aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet. And a huge ticker, a series of ticker tape parades uh, around the country. The picture I chose is the one in uh, coming down Broadway in New York because I'm from New York. And can you make out the three astronauts here in this sea of people? They're right there. <laughs> okay. Then we had Apollo 12, 13, 14, and 15, all crewed missions, all manned missions. Um, I'm not going to go into detail because I want to spend the rest of the time on Apollo 16, but those were four uh, Apollo missions. Apollo 12 uh, had a very similar mission to what Apollo 11 did. Apollo 13 was the one that had the explosion on the way to the moon. The lunar landing had to be scrubbed. NASA had to try to figure out how to save the astronauts and get them back safely to Earth because the explosion knocked out a large part of the life support system on board the spacecraft. So uh, it's an amazing success story, even though the planned lunar landing was a failure. They, they nicknamed this mission the successful failure, Apollo 13, because they got the astronauts back alive. And then Apollo 14 and 15, they both used, let's see, uh, yeah, they both used, um, no, not Apollo 14, Apollo 15 was the first one where we brought a lunar um, rover, like a little dune buggy, but that Apollo 16 did too, so we'll see pictures of that. But that leads us up to Apollo 16 and the mission patch here. Um, uh, John Young... Ken Mattingly, and Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke is another one of the astronauts that walked on the moon that I uh, got to meet. And actually, he, uh, he signed this. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a bit old, older now, and you can hardly read it. But uh, he did address it to me, and he signed the picture of himself there uh, on the moon for me. So I keep that up in my office. But uh, we'll see pictures of Charlie Duke here in a minute. Here's the three of them. So now, uh, this is... Uh, Ken, left to right, Ken Mattingly, who is the command module pilot. Uh, his name was Thomas, but he went by Ken Mattingly. And then the commander of the mission, of the Apollo 16 mission, is John Young in the center. And then uh, lunar module pilot Charlie Duke, uh, the fellow that uh, I got to meet here in Rapid City. He actually came to, a, uh, actually was at the Civic Center quite a few years ago, and it was like a prayer breakfast. And there was hundreds of people from Rapid City that went to it. And I was lucky enough to be able to catch him and have him sign that picture for me. But uh, he was on Apollo 16. Now, a little history of Apollo 16. This is the rollout of the Saturn V rocket of Apollo 16. This first rollout occurred on December 13, 1971. Okay. Um, in January of 1972, 
Multiple issues led NASA managers to announce a one-month delay from March 17th to April 16th, 1972, as the launch day. So they were initially going to launch it on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. But uh, there were some problems that were developed. Uh, later in January, the mission faced even more trouble after a command module fuel, fuel tank was damaged during a test on the launch pad after this rollout. So again, the crawler brings it all the way out to the launch pad, which is way over here somewhere. And they were doing a test, and one of the uh, fuel tanks uh, was damaged in the test. So they had to roll it all the way back and put it into the vehicle assembly building. This is another reason for the delay. And uh, they had to fix it. And then they had to roll it out again for a second rollout. That year, 1972, also started off on a sour note for astronaut Charlie Duke. He began to feel ill during the crew's December 1971 geology field trip to Hawaii, where they were going to practice collecting rocks like the types of rocks that they would see on the moon and do some training there. Well, he got sick. Now, this is interesting because Charlie Duke was also the astronaut during the Apollo 13 mission, two years earlier, that uh, was, he, he actually uh, was exposed to the German measles by his neighbor's child. What did I say? Uh, no, it was Charlie Duke who was exposed. And, 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 and what he did was, was he, was, he, 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 he was exposed by, by his neighbor's child. He then exposed Ken Mattingly because Ken Mattingly had never had the measles. And so the other two astronauts on Apollo 13 already had the measles. So they didn't have to get pulled from the mission. So it was something like three days before the launch of Apollo 13 that Ken Mattingly had to get scrubbed. And they put Jack Swigert in to take his place on Apollo 13. Of course, Apollo 13 is the one that had the explosion but they got the astronauts back okay. But Ken Mattingly was watching all that on Earth because he got pulled from the mission three days before he was supposed to go to the moon. So, he, of course, he was, he was highly disappointed. But the weirdest thing is, is that, is that both uh, Charlie Duke and Ken Mattingly ended up getting paired up on Apollo 16. So Ken Mattingly did get to go and be command module pilot. Um, as he was going to do in Apollo 13. He just did it two years later in Apollo 16, and he had Charlie Duke for a crew, crewmate. But I mean, can you imagine what Charlie Duke was thinking at this point now? Because now he's getting sick just a few days before his, his next launch. But uh, he was, because of the delay, because of the one month delay in Apollo 16, they were able to allow him to recover. And it says here, uh, he managed to fly to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida on January 3rd, but his condition worsened. The next day, di doctors diagnosed him with double bacterial pneumonia and admitted him to Patrick Air Force Base Hospital near Kennedy Space Center for treatment. The other crew members were not affected by Charlie Duke's illness and continued their activities while he spent a week in the hospital. But he had time to recover. Because of the month's delay, he was able to finish his training and he was able to go up. <laughs> so it was just an amazing sequence of events there, but uh, interesting stuff. So anyway, here is Apollo 16 on the launch pad, pad 39A, during the first rollout, December 13th of 1971. And then here it is about three months or more later, um, uh, on, on March 29th, 1972. And this is getting now to within just a couple of weeks of the actual launch. That's after the second rollout. And here's the actual launch on April 16th, 50 years ago tomorrow, uh, at 12.54 p.m. from launch pad 39A, the Saturn V rocket that is taking uh, those three astronauts uh, that are in the nose of the rocket in the capsule on their way to the moon. Now, I'm going to play for you a small video just for about 20 seconds long, but it's going to give you the 
this has sound to it, and it's the actual launch of the Apollo 16 rocket taken from several miles away. And they always talk about how incredibly powerful these Saturn V rockets were, and you'll get a, a feel for that with this. Liftoff had been perfect. During the three day flight to. So the duration was 11 days, 1 hour 51 minutes. Um, they traveled a little over 1.3 million miles during this uh, Apollo 16 mission. Um, the landing spot was the Descartes Highlands, and they landed on April 27th the Pacific Ocean and were picked up by the USS Ticonderoga. So we'll see some images now from Apollo 16. This is the actual launch that we just saw the video of. And you can see the spectators and press people are viewing it at a vantage point about three miles away from the launch pad, um, taking pictures and motion pictures of it. Here's Gene Kranz, who was also the mission, uh, uh, the flight director of uh, Apollo 16, as he was for Apollo 11 and 13, and I think several of the others. And this is just a picture out at, at Mission Control in Houston on uh, the day of the launch during a television transmission from the spacecraft uh, in transit from Earth to the moon. The monitor in the background shows a view of Earth from the spacecraft as they're just leaving Earth's orbit that first day. And then some problems developed. Um, this is taken on day four. Uh, the problems were worked through, but it shows some of the NASA officials deciding whether or not they're going to allow the lunar module to actually descend from the command module to the surface of the moon. Problems included a stuck boom that held a spectrometer that was on the lunar module, and that boom, that arm, stuck in position. They weren't able to retract it. That was one problem. And then um, uh, Ken Mattingly, who was the command module pilot that was going to stay in orbit around the moon, noticed that he, there were some oscillations in the backup gimbal system of the command service module's service propulsion system engine. And what that meant really was that if that engine didn't work properly, they would not necessarily be able to successfully undock and, and redock the lunar module with the command module and get all three astronauts back safely. So they seriously considered scrubbing the lunar landing portion and just making it an orbiting mission like Apollo 8 was. But they were able to work through the problems and decided that the risk was low enough that they could still send the astronauts down. So they did. And they ended up being correct. This is Charlie Duke, again, uh, lunar module pilot saluting the flag on the day of the landing, April 21st, 1972. In the background, the Stone Mountain uh, area of the highlands uh, crosses most of the horizon of the background. Um, it's a lot higher, actually, than it looks in the picture, but it, but it is a highlands. Um, this picture is interesting. The astronauts noticed uh, after they got off, and actually even when they were looking out the windows um, on the way down, they noticed so that the paint had been blistered, um, and, and was, that blistered paint was visible on the ascent stages outer aluminum skin. This doesn't look too good, does it? Uh, yeah, the, the lunar module actually was made of very, if you will, lack of a better word, flimsy material because it didn't have to be made of really strong material. Because when it got undocked from the command module, there is no atmosphere. It's not going to be pushing against wind. So um, it just needed to be enclosed, but the walls did not have to be tremendously thick. 
uh, to protect the astronauts inside uh, as long as there were no leaks, you know, for the oxygen to get out. So anyway, it just, uh, I, I searched and searched as for a reason why the paint blistered on this mission. Um, and it might have just been a bad paint job. I was never really able to figure out exactly why, but the problem was noted. And, uh, and, and, and I, I, I just was unable to find out that, you know, it didn't, I looked at all the NASA websites and I couldn't find an explanation as to why it happened, but uh, it did. So anyway, it wasn't catastrophic, thankfully. It didn't, it didn't uh, prevent them from getting back. And then you can see the lunar uh, rover. I mentioned this is one of the second mission where the lunar rover was used. Um, and uh, John Young was the only one that drove it, although Charlie Duke was the other one that went down to the surface. He was not a driver of the lunar uh, rover. You can see uh, here is a picture here during the first EVA, which is the extra vehicular activity, which means like a spacewalk or, or you know, you're, you're going outside of the vehicle, extra vehicular activity. There were three of them where they, they went back in and out of the, the lunar module three times. And here they had deployed the lunar rover. And uh, John Young here is uh, getting, getting ready uh, for his first traverse on the moon. And here you can see he's giving it quite a workout quite a speed workout, going over rocks and bumps and uh, with not much gravity on the moon. When you hit a bump, it really, it really takes a jump. But uh, Charlie Young was videotaping him on these various uh, excursions. And then uh, this is a picture of uh, Charlie Duke at, uh, uh, at one of the uh, craters at the landing site um, picking up samples. And I mentioned uh, the large sample, the largest rock sample was collected during this mission. It's, it was nicknamed Big Muley. And this is a TV picture from one of the TV cameras that was recording Charlie's work as he's picking up Big Muley. It ba this, is, this is a picture of it as it is now. It's visible, you can see it. It's lunar sample 61016, better known as Big Muley. It's the largest sample returned from the moon as part of the Apollo program. The rock is a 26 pound breccia consisting mainly of shocked anorthosite. You gotta be a geologist and know what that is. Uh, attached to a fragment of uh, troctolitic melt rock. It is named after Bill Muehlberger the Apollo 16 field geology team leader. So he trained the astronauts uh, on, on the, the geology that they needed to know. And so they, they named this big, big sample Big Muley in honor of him. And you can see another big rock that they didn't bring back, couldn't bring back, uh, next to the, the lunar rover. Okay, and now getting back to the end, uh, here, April 27, 1972, the astronauts are just seconds away from splashdown uh, in the Pacific Ocean with the command module, the parachutes fully deployed, a perfect uh, splashdown, no problems at all uh, in the Central Pacific. Here we see uh, the Apollo 16 recovery crew uh, coming in. The, the frogmen will jump down, help the astronauts out of the capsule, get them into a floating buoy and bring them back to the USS Ticonderoga, where they will be given the red carpet treatment on the deck of the Ticonderoga. And that command module, if you want to see it, is actually on display now uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, at the US Space and Rocket Center, uh, located basically uh, right next to uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, which is one of NASA's nine NASA centers around the country. So, that completes the story of Apollo 16. We're now fast forwarding 50 years. This is a picture that was just taken, actually this past St. Patrick's Day of this year. So just about a month ago. What's today's date? The 15th, yeah, about a, not even a month ago. This is a rollout of a giant new rocket. We haven't had rollouts of rockets like this since the Apollo days, okay? We rolled out the uh, space shuttle and they were, that was big. But this is 
It, it, it isn't even given a name yet, but it's called the SLS, the Space Launch System. It is the rocket that will bring our current astronauts back to the moon in NASA's Artemis mission and eventually on to Mars. It is the most powerful rocket made by mankind. This space launch system being rolled out just outside of the vehicle assembly building. This is literally just hitting the sunshine as it's rolling out the door of the vehicle assembly building this last March 17th on the crawler. It will yield 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, this rocket. Compare that to the giant Saturn V's that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. That had 7.6 million pounds of thrust. This has 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. I wish you could have heard the launch of that other one because it was such a rumble. This will even be a bigger rumble. <laughs> and uh, and this, this will carry our Artemis astronauts back to the moon. Now, the reason it's called Artemis is that in this mission, NASA will has committed to making sure that one, at least one of those astronauts that goes back to the moon now, all with an eye toward doing what we need to do and learning what we need to learn to send people to Mars, that crew of astronauts is going to include a female astronaut, a woman astronaut. And Artemis, in Greek mythology, is the twin sister of Apollo. So they call this mission the Artemis mission. And I will now wrap up the talk with a... Uh, this, this just shows the... Uh, uh, the rocket on the launch pad. Uh, th this is actually on pad 39B, which is right next to 39A, which is wh where we saw um, the, the Apollo uh, 16 take off from. But this is, this is Artemis. So now I'm going to uh, play a little video. Now what this video is, is it starts out with a little history on Apollo, just a few seconds, but then it gets into the Artemis mission, and it's all animated. But you really have to, if you really want to understand the Artemis mission, you have to watch this video like three times. I'm only going to play it once. It's like five minutes. But it will, it's an excellent overview of all of the components associated with the Artemis mission. So uh, if you don't catch everything the first time, don't feel bad because it's a lot of information compressed into five minutes. But it'll, it'll give you a good idea of what that, that uh, mission will be like. Let's see here. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. 
With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting Gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from Gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. Yeah, everybody give Tom a big round of applause. Um, I think, Tom, you'd take some questions from the audience, right, uh, at this point? Or am I, I didn't close you up too fast, did I? That was the last part, right? That was, that was the last part. <laughs> okay. Got my question there. We just there had we to go. persevere so. through the technology again. Obviously, NASA's way better at it. <laughs> so I will walk around with the microphone if you guys have a question for Tom. Uh, I appreciate the kind of reminding history behind all of the missions there, Tom. Uh, that was really great. I really do want to know where Big Muley's at, <laughs> just so you know. But other questions, you guys just raise your hand and I'll come to you. Do you have a question? Uh, we'll let somebody else ask one. You come up with a really hard one. Uh, with regard to the lunar rover, do you know about how far they, they drove it in total oh, distance? Oh, yes. I, how, I, and how far it got away from the lunar module? I did read that, but I can't remember the number right now, actually. So, um, it, it, yeah, it is known. I just, uh, I, I can't, I, it, it was over a mile, I know that. And uh, exactly how much more, I can't remember. Yeah. Really? Whoa, 16 miles. Well, well that is not appropriate. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, wow. 
You mentioned the James Webb Telescope and somebody coming to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, when oh, is when, when is that going to happen? Right here, yes. Arjun Ayangar, who was a NASA space ambassador while he was going to the South Dakota School of Mines. And so that's how we got affiliated with him. And he now has a super secret job that he can't talk to me about, <laughs> but he can broadcast out of a basement and Zoom a program about the telescope. So I'm curious what these astronauts did after going into outer space. Ah, yes. They were in their, what, 20s or 30s? It seems like going to outer space or being on the moon is quite a pinnacle of one's lifetime, but what do you do after that? Right, yeah, that's a good point. I, I know, you know, what a lot of the astronauts went on to do. Charlie Duke, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't remember exactly what line of work he went into. Oftentimes, they uh, would be hired by aerospace companies for uh, advice and to serve on boards. Um, and things like that. Others stayed associated with NASA, although they were no longer considered active astronauts. Um, Gene Kranz, I remember, he's still there. He's, he, you know, he wasn't an astronaut, but he was a, the flight director. He's a great guy. We've gone down with several student groups that have actually, um, from the School of Mines, that conduct experiments in NASA's zero gravity plane, that the, the, the plane uh, that the astronauts train in. And Gene Kranz comes out and speaks to student groups to this day. But um, so he was just like this incredible wealth of institutional knowledge. So NASA wanted to keep him around. And uh, uh, but uh, as far as uh, exactly what, uh, uh, you know, Ken Matt, oh, oh, John White. Um, John White did go on to become the, a, a space shuttle uh, astronaut. Af after Apollo. In fact, he was on the very first uh, shuttle launch, the shuttle mission, STS-1, Space Transportation System 1. There was over a hundred shuttle missions. Uh, you know, that, the space shuttle built the International Space Station that's in orbit now. It would bring pieces up and put it together in space like a jigsaw puzzle. Well, um, John Young was the very first, uh, I should have brought it with me, but I have a U.S. flag that actually flew on that um, on that first space shuttle mission that uh, was presented to the School of Mines and John Young was on, was on that mission. There were just two astronauts on that first shuttle mission. No? Other oh, questions or comments? Standing yes. around the room. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know if there's going to be any kind of uh, space program or space camps this summer. Ah, uh, yes, well, we certainly hope so. And the Journey actually is planning on, uh, consi you know, considering to put one on. What, what months did you have that planned it, for? We will be looking at August, but please just watch our website. Uh, we're still working on all things challenging in 2022, and that is making sure we have enough people to take care of everybody in the museum so that we can host a good space camp. Uh, we've traditionally put that on during the week of the rally because it's kind of a good week where there's no buses around so the kids can go crazy. You have a question. Uh -huh. Is there going to be an 18 Apollo coming soon? Ah, Apollo 18, that's a great question. Um, actually, there was something like initially 21 Apollo missions that were planned, but they decided to stop them with Apollo 17 in December of 1972. So um, that was the last Apollo mission. There won't be any more Apollo missions, but there will be the Artemis missions, which are, which are the new mission to go back to the moon. And we have to do a number of things that we didn't do on Apollo with the Artemis mission. One is we have to set up a lunar base. We have to learn how to live on the moon for a longer period of time because when we go all the way to Mars, which can be the, the trip itself can be 300 million miles. The moon is only a quarter of a million miles away, about 230,000 miles away. Mars, to get there, you have to travel about 300 million miles to get there. So we're not just going to land and spend a few days and come back like we did with Apollo. We have to land, and then you kind of have to wait for Earth and Mars to kind of realign to at a certain point to where the distance is not tremendously far 
to be able to come back again. So that usually, that's probably going to make it a two-year mission, two years, that the astronauts will have to be gone. And so that's a great question. But, but um, so with the Artemis mi mission, we have to learn how to build a lunar base because we're going to have to build a Martian base, meaning, meaning like a, a house on Mars, if you will. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> You could go on a Mars got, got mission. Yeah, yeah. There, the, the, you know, the, the, the original goal was in the 2030s. So it'll be, it'll be young people in your generation that'll be the ones that'll be the first human beings to ever step foot on another planet. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody. Would everybody give Tom a big round of applause? Um, <laughs> Obviously, we're not going to be done when it comes to this kind of programming, just like the James Webb Telescope, which I think will be the last Friday in July. I was trying to look that up on my phone. But we'll promote all of this stuff here. We'll also have uh, Megan Ostringa, our science educator. She'll be doing a couple programs here. She'll be doing Western Skies and Lakota Star Knowledge programs. So what you can look up into the sky and see for constellations, she'll be doing that on a seasonal basis throughout the year here. And the first one has been recorded. It is on journeymuseum.org uh, that she did in January uh, with us here. So there'll be four of those in total throughout this calendar year. Obviously, I'm looking forward to hearing a program on the Gateway, uh, more on the Artemis and all of that. Uh, but thank you guys for being here today. Thank you guys for your support. Keep watching us. We're going to keep working on all of the science education stuff because you guys all show up for us. So thank you so much.